Good evening, everybody. I was born in London, England, and it was then that I, after college, went to Israel and had an opportunity to learn in different yeshivas. And upon completion of smicha, I found my way to Montreal, Canada. What's interesting about living in a country where you didn't grow up is that you see not only that country, but indeed you see the world through different eyes. And when you leave home to go somewhere that is a little unfamiliar, then a lot of your assumptions about the world fall away, and some of the preconceived notions that you are carrying around with you are challenged fundamentally. I've been at the synagogue in Montreal for a couple of years, and some of the leadership approached me and said, we have a project. We know what the problem is, we don't have the solution. The problem is young adult engagement. People between the ages of 18 to 25, they're not coming to shul. They're not banging down our doors. They're not engaged. Although it is not a fully religious community, traditional Montreal community is such that those young adults between the ages of 18 to 25 are essentially outsourced to Hillel. And yet we have somebody in the community that says, perhaps synagogues could be the solution. Perhaps, instead of synagogues being the problem, perhaps synagogues could be the solution. So we're sitting on a modest sum of money. What does it look like if we give you a blank slate and say, take this sum of money and come up with a solution to engage young adults here in Montreal? And so I had a question. What does a young adult want to do? How is it that a person between the ages of 18 and 25 express their Jewish identity? How do they connect with the Jewish people? And the answer, in a complicated way, is that for such an individual, Jewish particularism expresses itself through Jewish universalism. I most feel Jewish as little Johnny or little Karina, if I am helping African children in an orphanage, I feel most in touch with who I am as a Jewish person if I'm feeding hungry people in a mud hut in Africa. And so we took the idea of doing something radical, doing something that no synagogue, at least in Montreal, had done before, and taking a social action mission but I decided to go one step beyond. And looking at the successes of March of the Living on the one hand, birthright on the other, the successes were short-lived. As soon as you had transplanted the people over, plunked them down, they had a great time, you brought them back, and life continued. There was a loss of context. What does it look like if you build that context early? And so we started a Beit Midrash program, where on a weekly basis, the students would come into the synagogue, we created a curriculum looking at poverty, health, starvation, hunger, and we looked at what does the Torah have to say about these themes? What does it look like when we take our values and virtues and the things that we hold precious to us in our tradition and we put it into a language that connects with these students? And for a year we learned. And at the end of the year we took a trip. And we went to Africa. We then followed that up by a trip to Israel and the students were changed. We went to Soweto, we went to some of the bleakest places on earth where people would live in, if not a mud hut, housing that was made up of just corrugated sheets of tin with a further sheet of tin as a roof. We went to orphanages. The first stop was to a school where the children extensively were born with HIV and if not had contracted it before they were teenagers. And they had so little. And these young adults fed them lunch these young adults started to interact with them. And we might not have spoken their language, and we might not have been able to communicate verbally. But communicating with body language and communicating with the language of love, communicating with a much deeper language of just a human connection, in a very short space of time, a great bond was connected between us. And it was then that I realized that as happy as these kids were running around, 
without shoes on, sometimes without even proper clothing, adequately having a top or shirt to cover their backs. I said to myself, as little as these kids have, they have so much. Look how happy they are. Look how fulfilled they are. And yet, as much as these kids from Montreal have, sometimes we have so little. And it was then when we came back and the enthusiasm was on fire, that people said, when are we doing it again? How can we go further? How can we repeat this? How can we deepen it? And so I said, look, we looked at poverty, we looked at hunger, we looked at starvation. But now I think it's time to go deeper. It says 36 times in the Torah, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. What does it mean to be a slave? This is the Torah's perhaps meta theme. The treatment of the stranger, the poor, the orphan, the marginalized. Someone who is weak in the world. Treat that person with respect. And twinned with this is the beginning of the Torah's account of God creating man in his image. That sense of a B'Tselem Elohim human dignity that stands beneath everything. And so I said, let's really sharpen the saw. Let's learn about human dignity. Let's learn about what it means to be free. Let's learn about what it means to be a slave. And let's go to some of the darkest places in the world. And let's look at the human sex trafficking industry in Thailand. Because today, it's a reality, and not just in Thailand, but across the world. But what does it mean to take a Torah and make it relevant to somebody who doesn't understand that it could be relevant? What does it mean to take our values and say, this is something that is real. This is something that has to impact your life, because it can impact your life. And so over the course of this year, we've been looking at human freedom. We've been looking at slavery. We've been looking at Judaism's sex ethics. We've been looking at what it means to sell another human being as a slave. And in just a couple of weeks from today, another contingent of students are going to be traveling to Bangkok and literally being taken into a bar and being told through the wonderful people in the NGOs who work on the ground to buy a 15-year-old girl a drink and start a conversation with her. And then after five minutes of talking with her, say, listen, thank you very much. It was lovely to meet you, and I wish you well. Have a good day, and then to walk out of the bar. So I spoke to the NGOs, and I said, why would we do this? And they said, this 15-year-old girl has never in her life of prostitution had a Westerner buy her a drink that five minutes later has not led to that leading back to his hotel room. It will put a chink in her armor of her own expectations of her life as to how she can see a potential different tomorrow than the life that she has today. And we're also going to be taking trips to Chiang Mai and to Chiang Rai and looking at the causes of poverty, the cycles of how education isn't met appropriately or efficiently and being able to teach in schools and to build infrastructure. And a revolution is taking place today that synagogues can be, and I think this is a flagship that can be repeated across North America, maybe even the world, that there are synagogues that can be part of the solution for the apathy of the young adult lack of engagement that we are encountering. It could be that instead of being a place where young adults don't come to, instead the synagogue can be with the right creativity, the right learning, the right X factor, and we all realize what that is, even though we can't put our finger on it. But when you meet those individuals, you say they've got it. And you bring those individuals inside the synagogue, and then suddenly the synagogue is alive. Suddenly there's a rejuvenation. There's a Polish famous folk story of a man who traveled to the other side of Poland to follow his dreams to find a box of treasure hidden underneath a bridge. As he gets there, a policeman is blocking his way, and eventually he catches up with him and says, explain yourself, what are you doing here? He says, I followed my dreams. I traveled across Poland here to find my treasure. He says, you fool, there's no treasure here. Go back home. You think I follow my dreams? In my dreams, I also dream of treasure. And on the other side of Poland, there's a box of treasure, and as the Jew is listening, he realizes that he's describing his home, his own backyard. And so indeed, he returns and digs in his own back garden, and there he discovers the gold that was hidden within the entire time. 
Sometimes by traveling far, we challenge our assumptions, we see the world differently, and we're able to make a true difference. If only small ripples that eventually will cascade and turn into a tidal wave of love, of healing, of tikkun. And if we can do that, our young adults will realize that it started all the way back in their own homes, in their own gardens, in their own backyard, inside the synagogues that they will hopefully become a part of. Thank you.